You know, few people would dispute that Jesus Christ is probably the most popular and most influential figure of the past 2,000 years, and yet many people do not really know him. They may know something about him, but they don't know him in a real and personal way. And that's what we're after during this 13-week study. Very simply, we want to know Jesus Christ. Today is part two, as Pastor Steve said, in our new series, Jesus Is. I invite you to open your Bible. If you closed it, reopen it to John chapter two, outlining your bulletin. Great to have you online. I know some of you stayed in. We had lots of folks first service, and great to have many of you joining us again uh, this service. So while you're turning to the Gospel of John, let me ask you a question. We'll put a picture on the screen. What is this? Anybody know what is this? Yes, it's, it's a roundabout. How many of you like roundabouts? Just a poll here. All right. You know, I think it was about 25 years ago. I can remember it vividly. It was north of, 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 of uh, Albany. We were going to see, I think Danielle, we were going to see Dan and, and Stacy, our, our nephew and niece. Yeah. So um, anyway, uh, it came upon my first roundabout. I was sure I was going to sideswipe somebody or someone's going to side, I mean, like get me broadside. And to this day, um, I know they're growing in popularity. In fact, I read this week, upwards of 10,000 roundabouts now across the country. Uh, to this day, there's a bit of fear when I enter a roundabout because I just don't know really what I'm doing and what everybody else is going to do, if you understand what I'm saying. And, and yet the, trans the transportation gurus tell me that they increase traffic flow and they reduce accidents, actually supposedly, and they're environmentally friendly in that we're not all sitting around waiting for the lights to change and, and um, all that sort of stuff. All good, but can we agree, just agree that like signage for roundabouts is, what, I mean, what is this? It's, <laughs> it's crazy confusing. And I gotta tell you, every time I hear Google Maps say, enter the roundabout, take the second exit, and turn left. I just, that just, I'm like, what, what, wait, 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 what do I do? So anyway, I'm confused, and some of you say, wow, remind me never to ride with you, buddy. I just, right. <laughs> but you know, following signs can be challenging, right? I mean, this is confusing stuff, and that's true, not only on the road, but it's also true in the scriptures that uh, we're going to get into today, as we're going to see. I've titled today's message, Can You Follow the Signs? Very original, right? Um, because in the second chapter, as we read, uh, Pastor Ben read just a few minutes ago, we come upon what John describes as the first of Jesus' miraculous signs. And so our plan today, our plan today is a little bit of a unique one. We're, we're going to start in chapter 2. We're going to get into chapter 3 and chapter 4 and chapter 5 in the beginning of chapter 6. All right, And we're going to see that John gives us eight signs, some are outright miracles, some are key events, that all point to and reveal who Jesus is. So you all up for a little road trip this morning? I hope so, because that's where we're headed. That's where we're going. And obviously to get through four and a half chapters or thereabouts, I mean, we're going to have to pedal to the metal, right? This isn't pulling off and doing the scenic bypass and, the, and went all over the around, you know, roadside and, and delving in deep and all these, these verses and so on. No, no. Our goal today is to get the meaning of these eight signs and see what they reveal to us about who Jesus is. And then we'll ask our most important question. So you ready? You ready to go? Here we go. We're going to pick it up right where we picked it up earlier at chapter 2 and verse 1. Follow along. On the third day, a wedding took place at Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there. That would be Mary. And Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. And when the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, They have no more wine. Now, in our culture, running out of wine, even at a wedding, um, I mean, that'd be a bummer, right? Um, uh, but not, not a devastating deal. I mean, like, we have lots of things to drink. Uh, but not so much in that culture. Water was the most popular beverage, and second to that was wine. Now, their wine was very watered down compared to the potency of, of wine uh, today. But the, the, the reason it was so popular um, is that the process of, of creating wine basically took care of the bacteria, which meant it, it was very safe to drink. And so you got to understand... Uh, they, they drank a lot of wine and, and, and a lot of meals and so on. And, and you also have to understand that weddings were a big deal in this, in this culture. And we think weddings are a big deal today. They're nothing compared to Eastern weddings back then. You know, in our Western weddings, the bride is the big deal, right? The, the, the bride comes in, and Dana, you and 
Justin, are you going to get married? Yeah, going to pick, pick you out next month. I get to do the wedding right here. And you'll enter, and everybody will stand, and, and we'll hear, here comes the bride. Uh, not people singing, but you know, dun, 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 right? And it's all about the bride. It's all about the bride. Not so in Eastern weddings. It's all about the groom, Justin. It's all about the groom. And I'll have you know, just, just to notice, a father of four girls, I, I like to always point this out, that in that culture, it was the groom's family that paid for the wedding, right? <laughs> And I'm thinking, you know, we just ought to get back to the Bible. <laughs> and weddings would last for two to three days. I mean, it was a big deal. Both sides of the family, all the relatives would come. It was a big bash. And so this, this is the kind of wedding we got described here. So to run out of wine? I mean, that would be like inviting a whole bunch of people over for Christmas dinner. And then, oh, we don't have any food. I mean, it's kind of on that scale, right? This is a big deal. Now, that's on the practical sort of physical level, but on the spiritual symbolic level, there's another thing going on here. Because in the Old Testament, wine was a symbol of joy and gladness. It's all over the scriptures. I'll just give you an example. Psalm 104, speaking of the Lord, it says, He makes grass grow for the cattle and plants for man to cultivate, bringing forth food from the earth, wine that gladdens the heart's of his people. And prophetically, passages like Joel chapter 3 described a day when the mountains would drip with new wine. And that's referring to the joy, the gladness that, must, that the coming Messiah would bring. And so every Jew that, that knew the scriptures knew, knew under, understood that, you know, running out of wine at a wedding, that would be a major embarrassment on many levels, and it would be a point of shame for that family for years to come. People wouldn't forget it. So Jesus, here's their out of wine, and, and he orders that six jars, and John tells us they held 25 to 30 gallons each, be filled to the brim with clean water. John tells us um, after that, that Jesus orders that a, a sample be given to the master of the banquet, who was flat out floored by how great the wine tasted. Now notice, there wasn't any, any prayer here. Did anybody see a mention of a prayer? Right? They didn't all gather around, lay hands on the, on the, uh, on the, um, the, the cisterns of the, the jars. You know, no incantation, right? no waving of arms, no hocus pocus at all, right? Nothing. No. He fills the jars and he transforms it to wine. That's sign number one, water to wine. Look at verse 11. This, the first of his miraculous signs, Jesus performed at Cana in Galilee. Thus he revealed his glory, and his disciples put their faith in him. Now what we need to understand is, while this is a very practical miracle and taking care of a very practical, physical need, there's a bigger deal going on here because Jesus has also transformed what would have been an incredibly embarrassing, could we say, shameful event into a joyful one. Don't miss that. Jesus transforms shame into joy. Now, from that wedding in Cana, notice what's next in the chapter. My Bible has a heading. Does your Bible have a heading above verse 12? My Bible says, Jesus clears the temple. That would be sign number two, clearing the temple. Because from verse 12 to the end of the chapter, that's the scene. So let's pick it up, verse 13. When it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple courts, he found men selling sheep, doves, and, and doves, and, and yeah, cattle, sheep, and doves, and others sitting at tables exchanging money. Verse 15. So he made a whip out of cords, and he drove all from the temple area, both sheep and cattle. He scattered the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. To those he stole doves, who sold doves, he said, Get out of here. How dare you turn my father's house into a market? And what we also need to understand is this fulfilled very specific prophecies concerning the coming Messiah. Passages like Malachi 3, Zechariah chapter 14, which describe the day of the Lord, the day of Messiah's coming, being a time when he would purify the temple. The prophetic language is he would be like a launderer's soap. He would be a refining fire. Temple worship. And if the temple ever needed cleaning, it was in Jesus' day. Not just from the filth that came from you know, uh, selling animals, but from the extortion and the outright racketeering that was going on in that place. Here's the deal. Once a year, every Jewish male had to pay the temple tax. 
No escape. Every male had to pay the temple tax, which was half a shekel. And it could not be paid in a Roman or a Greek coin. It had to be exchanged for the temple coin. All right, that's fine. But was it, what wasn't fine was the exorbitant exchange rate. Upwards of 50% of what was being exchanged would have to be paid in a, in a fee. The bottom line was the temple was making an enormous windfall from this scheme. And Jesus wasn't going to have it. He cleans house. Notice verse 17. His disciples remembered that it is written, zeal for your house will consume me. Right. Jesus is all about removing injustice and restoring worship back to the temple. All right, next chapter. Chapter 3 opens with another sign. And we've taught on this passage many times in the past. I love this chapter. One of the, I believe one of the most important chapters in the entire Bible. But here's how it goes. It goes, as we get into to, uh, John chapter 3, John introduces us to a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the 70-member Jewish council known as the Sanhedrin. These men were hyper-legalistic Pharisees, all about dotting the I's, crossing the T's, making sure everybody was doing what they're supposed to be doing. And they, they you know, paraded themselves as, as being great teachers and so on. Well, Nicodemus was a, a teacher. He was a rabbi. That's what the word rabbi means, teacher. So this third sign reads, teacher, or teaches, uh, um, teaching the teacher. There it is. The third sign reads, teaching the teacher. And so Nicodemus is, is amazed by Jesus, by the miracles he's been doing, and he wants to talk to Jesus about these miracles, but <laughs> they sit down at night and Jesus cuts to the chase. He gets to write what Nicodemus needed to hear, and he tells him, you need to be born again. And that blows old Nick's mind. He's like, What? Born again? What are you talking about? Born again? I mean, and he asks the question, how can an old man go back into his mother's womb and be born again? What, is it, what does that mean? You get it, right? He's thinking physical birth, and Jesus is talking about a spiritual birth. And so again, the Pharisees are all about keeping track of who's doing what, make sure you're doing the right thing, not doing the wrong thing, and all that sort of stuff according to their rules. And Jesus says, you got it all wrong. You guys have got it all wrong. Look at verses 16 and 17. He says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. There it is, third sign. Jesus is all about replacing condemnation with love. His love. And this would have been a massive paradigm shift for this Jewish leader named Nicodemus and people like him. The Jews, you see, were expecting the Messiah to come and to deal with the pagans, to deal with the Gentiles, the Romans, and all these people that would not follow the law of God. They wanted the Romans and all the godless people out, and they wanted the kingdom of God to come as they understood it and be ushered in. But Jesus comes and he says, no. No, I haven't come to judge the world. I've, I've come to save the world. Judgment will come, but at my second coming. So Jesus replaces condemnation with love. Okay, we'll keep moving. Chapter 4. In chapter 4, we have a flat-out fascinating account. It's only recorded in the Gospel of John. There's several of these, but it's a conversation Jesus has with a uh, a Samaritan woman. Remember this story? Many, many of you probably do. In verse 3, John tells us that Jesus had been in southern Israel, the area of Judea around Jerusalem, and he's decided now to go back north to Galilee. That's in the upper region around the Sea of Galilee. Now, in Israel, if you travel from north, or from north, south to north, right, I mean, it's a straight line. If you, you look at Jerusalem to Galilee, to the Sea of Galilee, I mean, it, it is a straight line, 70 miles, thereabouts, four days or so in good weather to walk, give or take. But the thing is, the Jews never went the straight route. The way they did it is they would go 25 to 30 miles east across the Jordan River, and then they would go north 70 miles and then they would go west 25 to 30 miles. Now, I don't remember much from my high school geometry, but I remember that the shortest distance between two points is what? 
a straight line. Is this a straight line? Uh, uh, no. So what in the world? Why would they do that? You say, well, better roads? Um, more scenic? Not at all. No, to go from, from south to the north and north to the south directly would mean that they would have to go through a territory they didn't want to go to because people live there that they hated. They hate it. Talk about prejudice. So that's what we're dealing with here. But notice what Jesus does. Verse 4. Chapter 4, verse 4. Now he, that's Jesus, had to go through Samaria. In the Greek it's actually stronger. He was compelled. It was essential. It was necessary for him to go through Samaria. Why? Why? Because he has a divine appointment there. This is, the sign is, this, this is a divine detour. It's a detour sign. We've got number four. And again, I'm going to summarize what happens. Around noon, Jesus sees a Samaritan woman drawing water from a well. Now, this would be very common in that day. Women often went to the community well to draw water out for the family. Very common. She would have that chore. But what isn't common is that she's doing this at noon. You say, well, what's the big deal about that? Well, noon in a desert climate, uh, that's the hottest part of the day. Women typically went to the, the well first thing in the morning when it was cooler. And you say, well, what's she doing at noon? Drawing water from the well. Well, you read on, it's because she's got a reputation. It's not a good one. So, here's the deal. This very Jewish Jesus <laughs> comes to this woman. Now, he's already broken two major taboos for a rabbi. First, he's talking to a Samaritan. And second, she's a woman with a reputation for getting around, all right? She's had five husbands, we learn, and she's living with another guy that's not her husband. But Jesus just simply comes to her and asks her for a drink. Now, notice her response in verse 9. The Samaritan woman said to him, you are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman, right? She gets it. How can you ask me for a drink? Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would ask him, and he would give, have given you living water. Skip down to verse 13. Everyone who drinks this water, meaning the water from the well, will be thirsty again, verse 14, but whoever drinks the water I give him will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Sound familiar? Different metaphor. Same message. Same message he said to Nicodemus, you need to be born again. Same message, different metaphor. Jesus has come not to condemn but to give life. She needs to be born again. She needs a spiritual birth. She needs to come and taste and drink of living water. Jesus goes on to say that God is spirit, and he's seeking those who will worship him in spirit and in truth. And that day became her spiritual birthday because that day she came to saving faith in Jesus. The point is that Jesus breaks down barriers and destroys prejudice with acceptance. There is no place for hatred in the kingdom of God. And this new Samaritan believer went racing back to her home, and there she shared the message of Jesus with some others, and then they came and begged Jesus, the scripture says, to stay with them, which Jesus did. He stayed in that Samaritan town for two days. The result, verse 40, 39, says that many came to a saving faith in Jesus. How awesome is that? Now, later in chapter 4, Later in chapter 4, we have another miraculous sign. Follow, follow along as I read. We're going to pick it up at verse 46. You all still there? You still following along with me? You're awfully quiet, but that's, that's good, I think, as long as you're still awake. Right? We're not pulling the car over, taking a nap. We're, can, I got the pedal to the metal. Let's go. Verse 46. Once more he visited Canaan and Galilee, where he had turned the water into wine, and there was a certain royal official whose son lay sick at Capernaum. When this man learned that, her, her, that Jesus had arrived in Galilee from Judea, he went to him and begged him to come and heal his son who was close to death. Unless you people see miraculous signs and wonders, Jesus told him, you will never believe. The royal official said, sir, come down before my child dies. Jesus replied, you may go. You may go. Your son will live. 
Notice this. The man took Jesus at his word and departed. Question, question, did Jesus, did, wait, did Jesus go to the house? Did he go, did he go, did, did he like lay hands on, have prayer over the boy? No, he didn't. No, Jesus saw that the man believed, that's why the man came. He believed that Jesus could help, that he could heal, and so Jesus did. That's a sign, that's a sign number five, seeing those who believe. So let's continue on, verse 51. While he was still on the way, this is the dad, while the dad is still on the way, his servants met him with the news that his boy was living. When he inquired as to the time when his son got better, they said to him, the fever left him yesterday at the seventh hour, and the the father realized that this was the exact time at which Jesus had said to him, your son will live. So he and all his household believed. The point is, Jesus moves where there is faith. You know, Hebrews chapter six, verse, uh, chapter 11, verse 6 is such an awesome reminder. And it says that without faith, it is impossible to please God. Because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists. And that he is the rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Mark chapter 9, verse 22, Jesus says, All things are possible for those who believe. Jesus moves where there is faith. Well, we were going to move down to chapter 5 now. Because we have another unique account that's only recorded in the Gospel of John. And again, I'm going to summarize. There's a pool in Jerusalem, and it's called the Pool of Bethesda. And it's fed by underground springs. Some of you who traveled to Israel with me, we've been to the Pool of Bethesda, haven't we? And, and you can go there and visit. I don't recommend going today, probably. I mean, just a little, wait a little while until things calm down over there. Pool of Bethesda. John says in verse 3, so in chapter 5, verse 3, here at the Pool of Bethesda, a great number of disabled people used to lie, the blind, the lame, the paralyzed. One who was there had been an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he had been in this condition for a long time, he asked him, do you want to get well? Sir, the invalid replied, I have no one to help me into the pool when the water is stirred. While I'm, while I'm trying to get in, someone else goes down ahead of me. And you can read on what the background is and so on about the pool of Bethesda. But we learn from what Jesus says later that this man's injuries were a result of something that he had done in the past. Some sin that he had committed and had caused him to be paralyzed in his legs. Now, I don't know what the details are and all of that, but I, I do know this. 38 years is a long time to lay around any pool. That's a long time. You know, historians tell us at the time of Christ that the population of, of Jerusalem was eighty to 100,000 people. But at the major Jewish festivals, three times a year at least, the population would swell to two to three million people would pack that city. So just think about it for a moment. Over the course of 38 years, how many people do you think walked past this man at the Pool of Bethesda and never stopped to help? You know, it's interesting that that Bethesda means house of grace. (laughs) You know what grace is? Grace is, we sung about it, right? This is amazing grace. Grace is undeserved kindness, undeserved favor. And that's what we're going to see right here. Sign number six is we're we're just going to call it amazing grace, all right? Verse eight, then Jesus said to the man, get up, pick up your mat and walk. At once the man was cured. He picked up his mat and walked. I mean, just think about that. So of all of the thousands of people, perhaps, it, around the city and in the, around the pool of Bethesda, Jesus selects this man that no one else would pay any attention to for 38 years. And he has a conversation. It's a brief one. And, and did Jesus pick up the man and take him down and put him in the pool? Oh, no. Not at all. One one moment, the man is paralyzed. He can't walk. And the next moment, he stood and picked up his mat and walked. I mean, how cool is that? That's incredibly cool. 
So in a matter of moments, Jesus restores dignity to this man who has been overlooked and pushed to the sidelines for nearly four decades. Well, in chapter 6, we have two more signs we need to move on. These are, two, some, these are among the most famous miracles that Jesus performed. Look with me. Chapter 6, verse 1. Sometime after this, Jesus crossed the far shore of the Sea of Galilee, that's the Sea of Tiberias, and a great crowd of people followed him because they saw the miraculous signs that he had performed on the sick. Then Jesus went up on a mountainside and he sat down with his disciples. The Jewish Passover feast was near. When Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming toward him, he said to Philip, where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? He asked this only to test him, for he already had in mind what he was going to do. Philip's an Philip answered him, uh, eight months' wages would not buy enough bread for each one to have a bite. <laughs> Another of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up, here's a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish. Now, how far will that go with so many? Now, we read five barley loaves, right? We've got to understand, right, this isn't like the little boy is carrying around, you know, five king-size uh, loaves of Wonder Bread. <laughs> and I, by the way, I asked the first service, and nobody knew, do they still make Wonder Bread? Can you buy the king's? Okay, I just, I just didn't know. All right. So it's not like that. I mean, this little guy, however, he's not he's got his little two fish and big five loaves of one. It's not that. No, barley, number one, was a, a poor man's substitute for wheat, okay? Not nearly as good. And think pita bread. He's got five pitas and two fish. How far do you think that's going to go? Not far. But heads up. Sign number seven, Jesus can multiply meager means. So here's the deal. Jesus says, everybody sit down. We learn it's 5,000 men plus their families. How many people is that? I don't know. A lot. He takes the loaves, he gives thanks, and then the disciples start to distribute them. Distribute them. And notice John says in verse 12, all had enough. <laughs> right. That, that is how God works. That's how God works. And I've seen this, I've got to tell you, this is one of the recurring lessons that the Lord has taught me over years. I think the first time I witnessed this firsthand was 22 years ago. I told the first service the story, and I've told this many times before. Some of you could tell this story for me probably, but I'm going to tell it again. I traveled to Malawi 22 years ago with a group of four pastors. A small, Malawi is a small, impoverished, landlocked country, Central Africa. Many of you don't even know where Malawi is. It's tiny. Look it up on your map. Malawi at the time was, I mean, riddled with HIV and AIDS. Huge problem. The average age for an adult male at that time was 38 years of age. Average age. I mean, that's, that was their life expectancy, 38 years, because of HIV and AIDS. And there were tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands growing rapidly orphans because of HIV and AIDS. The parents were dead. The grandparents were dead. The aunts and uncles were dead. There was no one to care for orphans. So we went to see firsthand what was going on. So here's the deal. We're at this little, little mud brick school, and I'll tell you what, at least I would say 500 kids, little kids all over the place where they come to get some little bit of education. And they're hanging out, they're everywhere. We're just trying to figure out, you know, how is life like, what's life like for them? And one of the pastors had brought a small suitcase with ring pops and, you know, a few bags of candy in it. A few hundred pieces, I mean, a couple hundred pieces of candy probably in that, in that thing. Well, one of the workers said, hey, you brought your candy. Do you want to give out the candy to the kids? And he said, sure. And I'm thinking, wait, 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 wait. We don't have enough candy. And I said, I don't think he has enough candy for everybody. And the, and the worker says, oh, no problem. And I'm thinking, I've got little kids at home. That's a really big problem. <laughs> right? That's a really big problem. 
Well, what they do, the pastors, we line up, and, and the kids all line up, they come up, and we reach in, and we kept reaching into this little suitcase and getting a handful of candy, and we were carefully giving each child their ration of candy. And I said, and they said, the other pastor said more than once, hey, we're almost out. The last piece of candy went to the last kid. And at that moment, I, not an audible voice, but the Lord said to me, I will take what you have, I will multiply it, and it will be enough. And he has said that to me over and over again. And here's the deal. We get so freaked out about the need, so freaked out about the, the obstacles. and No. God is the God who multiplies. We serve a Savior who multiplies meager means. Last sign, number eight. It reads, boarding the boat. Chapter six, you can read the account down further for yourself. I'm going to summarize. The scene is the Sea of Galilee again. It's evening. The disciples are in a boat. Jesus is not with them. And it frequently can happen. The currents come across the Mediterranean Sea and across the desert, hot desert, and then across the mountains and across down and sweep into a bowl, which is the Sea of Galilee. And that motion hitting the water can create waves, you know, violent winds coming over those mountains. And all of a sudden, you've got a, a storm out of nowhere. And that's exactly what happened, the way it sounds. And so there's huge waves, and the disciples are thinking, they're going down. We're, we're going to drown here. And then they see Jesus walking to them on the water. And he says, it is I. Don't be afraid. And John says, immediately the boat reached the shore. They're safe. <laughs> so this terrifying experience for these experienced fishermen, right, is at once resolved. Jesus calms terrifying fears in these men. Jesus has that ability to settle storms with a word. His very presence brings peace and calm. All right, we made it. Whew! Whew! And that brings us to the really good question of the morning. Help me out on three. One, two, three. So what? Right, quite a list we got here. Water to wine, clearing temples, one-on-one uh, -on -one conversations, big food events, walking on water. I mean, how in the world do we put all this together? What are these signs? How do they fit together, and what do they mean practically for you and me? Here's the thing. Here's the thing. Each one of them gives us details, lots of details here about who Jesus is. But they underscore two major themes that we're going to see repeated in the chapters that follow in the Gospel of John. And the first, first major theme is that Jesus is the Savior in every situation. Again and again and again, John is telling us is that Jesus is the one to look to in an emergency in every heartbreaking situation, in every time there, there's abject hatred and prejudice, every hopeless, terrifying circumstance, that's the time to turn to Jesus. He is the Savior in every situation. That's what John is, is revealing to us. But not only that, number two, Jesus is the Savior for every person. Let me say that again. Jesus is the Savior for every person. For every person living in shame. Jesus can take that shame and turn it to joy. For every person facing injustice, Jesus restores what's right. For every person feeling condemned, Jesus reaches out with love. For every person facing prejudice and discrimination, no, Jesus accepts. He embraces. For every person facing a desperate diagnosis, Jesus moves where there's faith. For every overlooked, forgotten, and marginalized person, Jesus brings amazing grace and he restores. For every person dealing with meager means, Jesus can multiply the resources. And every person living in fear, Jesus can bring peace and calm. All of these signs point to and lead us to the same destination. They all point to the truth that Jesus is the Savior for every situation. 
and for every person. And that includes you and me today. Let's pray. And I can imagine that in a crowd like this and those who are online, perhaps you are one that just feels incredible shame. Perhaps you've done something in the past and and it just seems like you continue to pay for it. You know what? Jesus can transform that shame to joy. You may be in a situation you feel is so unjust, so wrong. I want you to hear today that Jesus can restore that and make it right. And you know, for, for every person this morning that's feeling condemned and beaten down, you need to hear that Jesus loves you. He didn't come to condemn you. He came to love you, to save you. And for every person who feels as though they're up against prejudice and discrimination, Jesus has open arms. He accepts you. He embraces you. And for every person facing what seems like a really desperate diagnosis, Jesus moves. He'll meet you where your faith is. For, for every overlooked, every marginalized person, every forgotten person, Jesus would restore with amazing grace and for every person with meager means that just feel like you're living right on the edge. Jesus can, res can multiply those resources and for every person living in fear today, Jesus can bring you peace and calm. Lord Jesus, I pray for each person today, for each of us, in whatever situation we're in, I thank you for these accounts that have been preserved for us, that we would have faith, that we would believe that you are the Savior in every situation, that we can trust you, we can turn to you, just as these people found you faithful, good and loving, true. I, I pray that we would also find that to be the case. Lord, speak to our hearts today. Grow our trust in you, Lord Jesus, I pray in your name. Amen.